Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, for those of you that are joining us um, again, thanks for coming back. For those of you that are joining us for the first time, this is part two of peer listener training. You might want to take an opportunity to go back and either listen to or read the slides from part one. The link to that site is going to be provided in the chat because we are going to be referencing some terminology and skills that we learned during part one. So after the day's training, you might want to go back and, and refresh those skills if you've forgotten them over the course of the last couple of weeks or learn them for the first time. Materials that I'm presenting today or that we're presenting today were originally prepared by the Prince William Sound Regional Citizens Advisory Council with the help of Dr. Stephen Piku of the University of South Alabama following the Exxon Valdez oil spill to help uh, community members up in Alaska. Those materials were adapted for the Gulf region with the rest of the partners listed here, and we are adapting them again for this current crisis. So I'd like to thank all of our partners. A couple of ground rules as we begin here. Um, I ask that you please restrict your use of the chat box to things related to any technical issues or the um, activities that are um, taking place or the subjects that are at hand just so everybody can stay focused and attentive during this training. Um, we will be using an external polling system, so we do ask that you have access to a separate web browser either in another window or if you have a smart device, you can use that as well, and the instructions for that will become apparent when we hit those slides. When it's time for sharing, we ask that you simply chat your comments or, or questions to us. And we do ask that you select to chat to all panelists and attendees. Otherwise, you're just going to be privately messaging somebody there. And so we're not all getting the benefit of what your questions and comments might be. We all also ask that you're ready to learn and engage and share. But we recognize that we are going to be covering some difficult uh, materials today, and it's okay if you need to take a break, if you need to just take a few breaths, if you need to not engage in a particular activity. Uh, we are going to be talking about some difficult items, and some people might find some of the content challenging. So be kind to yourself, take a step away when you need to. To start off, and just to get to know each other a little bit better and to learn this polling system that we're using, um, we're going to be doing a little icebreaker activity. So I ask that you find your separate device or your separate web browser, and you're going to go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. And once you get to that website, you're going to type in the event code 774670. And it might take just a moment for folks to get there. And as you do, like I said, we're just doing a little bit of a, an icebreaker, move that out of the way for you. So just to figure out where people are at, where you're calling in from, where you're typing in from, we want to know where you're at. Where do you work? Maybe where you're sitting right now. Whatever you feel comfortable sharing. It could be the program that you work for, the agency you work for, what city or state you live in. It could be, um, you know, that you're sitting in your office or maybe you're on a deck or sitting on your couch or something like that. So just take some time, get familiar with this little polling service that we're going to be using, and we'd love to see where you're from. Great, we got Hawaii Sea Grant, Northern Gulf, my desk, mine also. I'm not sure if it's your home desk or you actually are in the office. Lots of folks coming in. Savannah, home office in Mississippi, Long Island, I see that. Virgin Islands, OSU. Somebody's on their cozy couch. That's nice. Mm -hmm. I'll give it a couple moments for people to type in their answers. Delaware Sea Grant, I see. Lots of C grant programs, obviously. Sisters, Oregon is lovely. My great aunt used to live there. Somebody's got kids in the background. I think a lot of us are experiencing that, too. Okay. Is that everyone? 
last moments to enter any comments you might have. Looks like everybody's all over the place. Well, thanks for sharing that. It can be a little bit lonely when we're doing these uh, Zoom webinars. Oh, more folks coming in. As you know, especially with security protocols and things like that, where we have people's cameras shut off and everybody's on, on mute and we are covering some difficult content. So it's nice to know who's out there and who I'm sharing with today and to kind of help our way through the, the rest of the hour and a half or so. So thanks for doing that. Okay. So the purpose of the training today is really to provide information and help to our community members that are going through this particular disaster and all disasters where we're learning skills, how to help them re-engage with their social networks, to establish better um, coping mechanisms, and to help regain the strength to move forward through this crisis. Now, I do want to have full disclaimer, though, that this is for educational purposes only. The content that we're providing here is not meant to help diagnose or treat anybody suffering from a mental or emotional disorder. And we will give you information about how to refer folks for services if you think that that's necessary. And as I said, um, some of the content that we are going to be sharing today does cover a lot of um, different types of abuse. So our, if you are feeling uncomfortable with it, which is totally normal, um, give yourself a break and take a deep breath and step away if you need to. Thank you. So today we're going to be covering parts three and four of the peer listener training manual. Um, the first one is recognizing symptoms. As I said, we're going to be going through a lot of different types of symptoms of mental and emotional um, types. And then we're going to go through providing support of how we as peer listeners can help um, provide support to our community members that are experiencing some of these symptoms. So certain portions of any population are more at risk for um, mental and emotional disorders. Um, those that have previously been suffering from mental illness are particularly high risk, but also those that are experiencing acute trauma or have experienced acute trauma. And it can also be folks that have experienced one or more of different kind of exacerbating stressors. Some of those might include experiencing frustration or uncertainty about economic impacts of a particular disaster. And we know that that's something that our communities are experiencing right now. There might be a, a sense of ambiguous loss, and we'll explain a little bit more about what that is, but it's kind of like it sounds. Um, they might be experiencing loss of faith in political institutions or other institutions of higher authority, healthcare systems perhaps. Um, they might have a, a history of past emotional um, disorders or emotional trauma, not necessarily mental illness. And it can also be folks that have been had experiences with long-term corrosive communities that we talked about during the first part of the training because they've already gone through different types of disasters. So some of the issues that we are going to be covering today, and it kind of spans the spectrum, um, are listed here. You, can, you know, anger and depression and post-traumatic stress disorder and um, risks of suicide and um, abuse and misuse of persons and substances and ambiguous, ambiguous loss. So to begin with, we're going to be talking about anger. And anger is a pretty universal emotion. In fact, it's the most common emotion that people tend to feel um, after a disaster. Even in natural disasters, people have a tendency to get angry. And when they're angry, they tend to be angry at someone or something. And sometimes the person or the thing that they want to blame are those agencies that they hold responsible for response. It could be first responders. It could be the government. It could be how they're getting their um, stimulus checks. Um, but people get angry. And the important thing to note is that while you might not agree with the anger or the placement of that anger, it's a normal part of the grief process and it should be validated like any of the other emotions that we're feeling. And there are costs and benefits to anger. A lot of us know a little bit about like negative sides of anger, but there can be positive aspects of anger. Um, for instance, it can energize and, and motivate us. You know, if we feel really strongly and we're angry about something, it can make us move where maybe we wouldn't have before. We 
start a, an ad campaign or we start, you know, calling our local representatives. Maybe we want to stop sign put in place because we're tired of people speeding or something like that. So anger can be really motivating. It can also be a really efficient and effective way of expressing how we're feeling about something. Nothing quite cuts through when you hear somebody speak angrily, you know how they're feeling about it. It might make the person that you're talking to snap to attention when they hear that tone in your voice. It can also alleviate tension. Sometimes you just need to be mad. That feeling of being able to vent and be angry about something can be cathartic and you can kind of purge it out of your system. You might end up feeling a little bit more relaxed afterwards. It can also give someone a sense of control that if they're an if they're angry about something, then something's not necessarily um, being done to them, but they're, they're taking control of their feelings and their emotions, and that can be stabilizing. But there are also negative aspects of anger. We know that it can be really disruptive to the thought process, so you're not necessarily thinking clearly when you're very angry. It may also prevent you from hearing and listening and understanding the emotions and feelings of others. When you're angry, you're not necessarily paying attention to how the person you're with um, is feeling. Um, it may also make someone or you um, impulsive or aggressive, but you're not necessarily checking your own actions because you're so angry that you're not thinking about how you're behaving and you might behave erratically or someone might behave erratically. But it can also mask true emotions. Sometimes people use anger as a defensive mechanism and they're kind of guarding themselves because they don't want to show how it is that they're really feeling. As I alluded to earlier, anger and blame can kind of go hand in hand. And just like anger can help us feel in control, blaming is also an effort to help understand and control what's going on, that you're, you're finding the, the person or the entity or the thing that is responsible for making you feel this way or putting you in this situation. But people can sometimes blame victims. We've all heard of victim blaming before, and that's basically an attempt to justify when bad things are happening because it's that person's actions that put them in that predicament. For instance, during COVID, um, you might hear people talking about, you know, if a community has increased uh, cases or you hear about particular individuals uh, contracted it, um, you might say, well, they weren't following instructions or they didn't do what they were told, or they weren't wearing a mask, or they did this, that's, that's victim blaming. Um, but people can also blame themselves. Maybe they put themselves um, in harm's way and now they're no longer able to go to work and provide for their families. Maybe they're worried that they exposed a loved one that had an underlying health condition and they're concerned that that has led that person to be put in the hospital. And self-blame though can be de destructive. It can lead to depression and some other emotional symptoms. We also know that blaming others can lead to anger, and being angry points to blame, and it ends up being cyclical, and it feeds on itself. Especially when we've got the ability to blame something or another entity that's kind of out of reach. When you're blaming, for instance, a government authority, you can't get the government in the room with you in order to express how you're feeling right there. And so you end up having this cycle of blame and anger because, um, you, you can't actually get to the people that you are, are that angry with. When people are, are angry frequently, a lot, particularly when it's that destruct, disruptive side of anger, it can lead to thought distortions. And there's several different types of thought distortions. The first is overpersonalization. That's basically saying like, they feel like they're responsible for everything, that all the things bad that are happening are because of them, and that's that self-blame that I was just talking about. There's also overgeneralization, and that's this idea that um, what they're feeling, everybody's feeling, or everybody should be feeling, and therefore they're not really understanding that somebody might feel differently than they are. Um, there's also awfulizing, and I kind of like that term. I think all of us have probably met people that awfulize, where it's worst case scenario language, that everything is terrible, that they're incapable of seeing the bright side to something. And then there's thinking in just extreme terms, black and white vision, as it were, not recognizing that there are gradations, there are things in between. Everything is not yes or no, black and white. Life is not that definitive. Um, and then negative filtering. And this is the other thing too, where everything that they are seeing, reading, 
encountering somehow is affirming and confirming the reason for their, their anger. And so it feeds back on itself. It's really hard sometimes when people are having distorted thoughts to um, be able to hear that, especially if we don't agree how they're feeling. But it's our job as peer listeners to listen to the person as they experience their anger. After all, that's why we're going through this training. That's what we're here for. So we want to use active listening. And that's that skill that we talked about in practice during the first part where we're engaged in listening. We're not necessarily responding. We're listening in order to hear, not to respond back. We also want to show empathy. And that doesn't mean that you have to completely get into an angry space with that person, but it's acknowledging the fact, you know, I felt that way too. Or like, yeah, sometimes I'm angry about that. I get why you feel that way. But you also need to allow space in the anger for reflection, to not feed back into it immediately. And that might be allowing for you know, longer pauses so that the person has a time to reflect on how they're feeling. In which case you might want to then maybe summarize their feelings for them. So what I'm hearing you saying is you feel angry about this because, and sometimes when you can label it and summarize it for them, um, it can take some of the sting out of that anger a little bit. And as I've been saying, you want to validate what they're feeling, remind them that this is a normal emotion, that we all feel this way sometimes. You're not trying to change how they're feeling or talk them out of being angry. So with that, we're going to go into our first knowledge check. We are using, um, for some of these, we're doing the Mentimeter for activities. Internally, we're doing polls. All of the polls are anonymous. And this first one is, thinking back on our discussion about anger, what are some positive aspects? And you can have multiple choice, one or all of them. You're welcome to answer them. And I'll give everybody just a moment to answer. So it can energize and motivate, can enable direct expression of feeling, and it makes one feel more in control. Choose any that you feel. All right. Okay, it looks like everybody chose something from all three of them, and all three of them, in fact, are, are correct. And yeah, it really can, like I said, it really can energize and motivate, but it can also be a really direct expression, and it can make people feel more in control. You guys are getting to hang out all these polling and um, activities are going to go. Okay, next we're going to talk about depression. Depression can have a lot of different signs and symptoms, and this is not an exhausted list. This is just some of the common ones that you might have thought of on your own. If I had asked you an activity to come up with five potential signs or symptoms of depression, I bet you most of you would have cho chosen a number of these off this list. But they can be things like just having a regular depressed mood, not just one day feeling down in the dumps, but, you know, kind of recurrent over a long period of time. The lack of interest in things doesn't mean people are necessarily crying all the time, but people can cry maybe for reasons that don't seem quite um, normal or ways that they didn't in the past. You might see changes in appetite or weight or loss gain, um, gain or loss of weight. Um, they might have a hard time sleeping or be sleeping all the time might be loss of energy and low self-esteem or um, poor attention or um, poor memory. Um, folks might be feeling hopelessness in general or in the extreme, they might be actually talking about death a lot or even self-harm. The fact is that uh, according to a, a, a study in 2017, more than 17 million adults in the United States had experienced one or more major depressive episode. And that's over 7% of all of U.S. adults. So it's a lot of, a lot of folks feeling this way. And that's 8.7% of all adult women and 5.3% of all adult men. We also know that folks with a multiracial background have a, a higher tendency towards major depressive um, episodes. And you can see on this graph that I have, you know, where it's broken down by um, gender and by age and also by race. So certain uh, races have a higher tendency towards major depressive episodes, those ones that are a little 
um, abbreviations. So you have Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders or um, American Natives and Alaska Natives. But we also know that depression can last for a number of years and having a prior depressive episode increases the risk of a future depressive episode. So as peer listeners, we are trying to help people that are experiencing depression. And one of the ways we can do that is encouraging people to participate in things they used to care about. That doesn't mean strong arming them into participating, it means encouraging them. We're trying to be helpful and not forcing people to do something they're not prepared for. And it's also offering some emotional support to people. It can just be listening. And that can be just engaging in conversation and really listening to what their responses are. Maybe they're feeling like nobody cares about how they're feeling or what they're going through. And it's your job as a peer listener to pay attention, to care, to actively engage them and affirm what it is that they're feeling. We also want to get people appropriate help for diagnosis and treatment. Remember, we're peer listeners. We are not licensed therapists or doctors. And so you need to be listening to people actively to know whether or not somebody is going to need additional support and help that are outside your ability to help them. And that's something we're going to learn about a little bit later on. The next couple of slides are about PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. And a lot of us um, have heard of this before. Um, we may or may not have met anybody that's experienced it. This is something that, you know, if you're a, a Gen Xer, we kind of grew up hearing this, this terminology, it's frequently associated with those that have experienced war or some major violent episode. And it's usually caused by an intense fear of, of serious bodily harm, but it can also be brought about by chronic exposure to distress and stress. So even if somebody didn't necessarily go to war, that doesn't mean they can't be experiencing PTSD. And that can be somebody's feeling intense distress when they're reminded of it. Maybe they um, lived through a hurricane and any time the anniversary of that event comes up, they are um, getting flashbacks, they might experience nightmares. They have these recurrent and intrusive memories that they cannot stop thinking about that particular event. And it can also be physically and emotionally disabling. Generally speaking, and this is a generalization, the symptoms for PTSD can kind of be broken into arousal symptoms and avoidance symptoms. Arousal symptoms are those ones listed here where they're more active symptoms where maybe somebody's irritable and angry or they're having a hard time sleeping. Um, maybe they can't concentrate fully, you know, at work or during a movie. Um, they might be hypervigilant and some of us, you know, might have experienced this before or, or heard of this before. Maybe somebody can't handle having a, an open doorway behind them, that they are always paying attention to who new people are coming into the room that may be easily startled if there's a change in conditions or a loud noise. And avoidance sim symptoms are a little bit opposite of that. Maybe they don't want to think about or talk about or hear anything about um, that disaster or event or trauma that's led them to be feeling this way. They don't want reminders of that anytime like the news comes up, maybe they get it turned off. They might even have loss of memory around that event that they've blacked it out and they don't they're avoiding that so much that they literally cannot even remember it happening anymore they might have decreased interest in things that they used to care about similar to what we see with depression might be feeling detached from others that they are experiencing something that nobody would potentially understand they could have restricted feelings on this subject or on other things and they might have a general pessimistic outlook and again, a lot of these things sound very similar to some of the other, like anger and depression that we heard about earlier. So as peer listeners, we want to be providing support for people that are feeling angry or depressed or experiencing PTSD. And we do that because it's in the name, mainly through listening. And that's not giving advice, it's not making judgments, um, it's listening. And that means that we share the joy, we share the pain, we listen to how they're feeling, we validate emotions, and we give those emotions back to them in an empathetic way. But we can also provide other types of emotional support. And really what it comes down to is having that person's back. Um, everybody needs somebody to have their back unconditionally without judgment. And that's what we're here to do as peer listeners. Doesn't mean you have to agree with what they're feeling or how they're experiencing it or how they're expressing it means that you're there to validate it and to be there in a supportive role no matter what. 
It can also be physical support. Somebody might need help taking care of their pets, like walking the dog or you know, feeding the birds or um, taking care of the kids for a little bit or helping take care of some elderly family members when you're allowed to go back together again. Um, but it can also be helping with yard work or chores or things like that, stuff that they feel is just overwhelming to them right now, but they know needs to get done, which then can create some feedback about them feeling like they're not being adequate and they're not able to do those things on their own. That's what we're here for. So mostly listening, but when you're able to provide emotional and physical support and you're um, comfortable doing so, then that's another role that we can play. One of the things we can do is affirm people's skills. People feel better about themselves when they're told that they're being successful and doing well at something. And those types of skills might be work skills. It could be you know, how good they are at managing a spreadsheet or personal skills like what a great gardener they are, how awesome their you know, homemade cookie recipe is or something like that. But we do know that affirming work skills works a little bit better when it comes from somebody in the same peer group or the same skill level at work. You wouldn't necessarily believe me if I, you know, was telling you how great you were at your job, but I didn't do your job or I've never done your job, so how would I know how good you are at that? So um, it's the same way with personal skills. If I've never eaten your cookies, how can I tell you you make the best cookies I've ever had? Um, but we also want to provide challenges, and when we're providing challenges to others, that means um, gentle challenges. It doesn't mean being forceful, but when we challenge ourselves, it can push us out of um, feeling stagnated. When we're challenging ourselves and others, we can help overcome where we're at right now. We're going to push ourselves a little bit um, to get through these hard times. But we also want to play. We want to have fun. And it might mean physically playing, literally getting outside and doing something fun or playing cards or something like that. But it can also just be um, laughing. Humor heals all, as many people say, you know, smiling and laughing and telling jokes and things like that can put new perspective on things that help us get through some of these challenging times. So speaking of challenging times, the next few slides I'm going to be talking about um, suicide. We do get into a lot of um, stats and figures and stuff, and so I apologize if any of this is triggering for anybody here. And again, you're welcome throughout any point of this training to take a deep breath, take a step away whenever you need to. Um, so some facts about suicide. We know that it's a leading cause of death in the U.S. According to the CDC, um, in 2017, it was the 10th leading cause of death in the U.S. Uh, already over 47,000 people took their own lives in 2017. We know that more than 50% of successful suicides had no known mental health issue or disorder um, prior to committing suicide. And we know that of those that had no known mental health disorder, 84% were male. We know that the majority of people that successfully commit suicide 80 to 95% of them, showed some kind of warning sign. And those are the things that we're going to be looking at for as peer listeners. They gave some indication that they were thinking about self-harm. Um, we also know that improvement in depression can lead um, to suicide or often precede suicide. And a lot of that can be that if somebody's been depressed for a long period of time and then they start to feel better, they don't want to go back to that low point in their life again. And so while they're thinking clearly and they feel like they still have control and they're able to act, they do act. And so that's something to be looking out for as well. We know that rates of suicide in the U.S. are higher among Native Americans than any other demographic. So if that's one of your stakeholder groups, that's something to be thinking about. Um, we also know that rates of suicide have increased in just about every single state in the U.S. over the last 20 or so years. So looking at this graphic right here, this is again from the CDC, we see every state other than Nevada, which saw a slight decrease, every other state in the union saw increases in rates of suicide um, from 1999 through 2016. So depending on where you're located, and we saw folks from all over the place in that first icebreaker activity, kind of look around to where your state is. Apologize, um, U.S. Virgin Islands aren't included in the survey, but I'm sure we can find some statistics for you if you're interested. Um, but we know it's, it's a problem, and that means that uh, peer listeners are, are needed out in our communities. 
So some common predictors of suicide that we know from those that have taken their own life. Um, it can be preceded by depression or a mental disorder, but not necessarily. Um, alcohol or substance abuse is frequently, though not always, involved. Um, people frequently um, talk about death, or they might have what's called suicidal ideation, that basically they're, they're fantasizing about self-harm in advance of it. Um, obviously, attempting it previously can be a, a strong predictor of um, completing it successfully at a later date. But also feeling isolated and living alone and not feeling you have a, a support structure around you can be a predictor of self-harm as well. And this idea of like hopelessness where you can't see a way out of your current situation, something that's called like cognitive rigidity, basically you've got a fixation on something and the way it is right now and you can't picture um, a different way of feeling, that can be a predictor of suicide as well. According to the CDC from studies in 2017, 2017 of successful suicides, there were a number of leading factors that contributed um, to that event. Um, first and foremost was what was called relationship issues, and that's not necessarily with um, intimate partners. It could be work relationship issues. It could be um, spousal. It could be with your parents or with your children. Um, a recent crisis. And interestingly enough, this doesn't just mean recent in the past, in like the last two weeks ago. It could be something in the future. It means like there might be an event that's coming up that is either triggering or they're concerned it's going to be triggering. Um, and so they decide to self-harm in advance of that event. Um, substance abuse and misuse is common. Physical health problems is another common one. And something that we might be experiencing given this current crisis is job and financial problems, uh, potential legal problems, maybe under you know, going through eviction or something like that, and loss of housing, all contributing factors to suicide. So as peer listeners, we want to talk to those that we're engaged with um, if you think they might be having suicidal thoughts. And you would be the best judge of this. If you're talking to someone and, and they're saying things in a way that makes you think that they're beyond just maybe a little sad right now, and that they might be having thoughts of suicide, we want to engage that person about it. We want to say maybe um, they've been telling you all about their day or all the things that they're dealing with, that they, maybe they've lost a job or they've lost a loved one and a lot of different things have been piling on. You might say something to them like, wow, that sounds like a lot. That's a lot to be carrying around with you. And it sounds like you're feeling pretty badly about that. Have you ever thought of hurting yourself? Um, it doesn't have to sound robotic. You're the person that knows best of how to talk to your friends. Um, but you want to ask them these types of questions to get them to start talking about how they're feeling. If they do indicate that they have sometimes thought about hurting themselves, then you want to kind of ask them about their plans. You want to get them to talk about it. And I know this sounds counterintuitive, and it's understandable if a lot of people find this um, disconcerting, the idea of actually talking to someone they care about about self-harm, um, but the idea is that you get them talking about it and maybe um, that opens them up to start reasoning with you about them or describing how they're feeling. But remember also earlier that statistic that 80 to 95% of successful suicide attempts gave warning signs in advance. And that's why we wanna talk about these things so that we hear those warning signs and we get people to tell us about them. Frequently, when people are thinking about self-harm, um, they're giving clues, and maybe they're subtle. Um, and if they're giving clues, even if they are subtle, it might mean that they don't want to do it, and they're looking for someone to listen to them, um, and maybe, you know, talk them into a different way. So we want to ask them about their plans, and we want to ask them to be kind of specific. We want to know if they have guns on hand. We want to know if they have prescription meds on hand that they might use, or poison, or something like that. We do want them to talk about it. And once we get folks talking about this, we want them to sign, verbalize and physically sign a no harm agreement. And this is literally telling them they are going to say something like, no matter what, I promise I'm not gonna hurt myself accidentally or on purpose. Um, get them to email it to you if you're having to meet virtually, get them to say it out loud to you when you're on the phone them to put it on a postcard if they need to and send it to you. It's them committing to the fact that they are not going to hurt themselves. 
Um, and then we're going to talk about referral for treatment in the next section. But briefly, if you think they're at a low risk, that maybe they're just kind of speculating about it or they're saying things that are kind of vague, but it's, it's not clear that they're really thinking about doing something imminently, you might give them some resources and then follow up with them and see if they use those resources or contact those resources at all to figure out whether or not you might need to push and follow up again and again. Now, if you think they're high risk, that's when we want to talk about immediate referral, and that's something that Tracy will go over a little bit later on. We also do not want to claim confidentiality. We're not going to get uh, folks to tell us that they're thinking about self-harm and then say, don't worry, I'm not going to tell anybody. People talking about self-harm, this is incredibly serious, and we don't want to keep those things confidential. We also don't want to tell them we're going to keep it confidential and then not keep it confidential because that's a break in trust. And then they're not going to talk to you again about anything. Um, so we don't want to break trust, and that's why we're going to be clear of saying, I'm not going to keep this confidential. You're thinking about hurting yourself, and I need to make sure that you're not going to do that and that you get some help. So with that, we're going to go into our next activity. We're going to go back to Mentimeter. Again, it's the same code, so you don't need to type in anything different. So when we're thinking about how we're going to respond to suicidal cues, I want you to think about this little scenario. So someone comes up to you, it could be a friend or a colleague, and said, doesn't you feel like life is worth living anymore? Maybe it's something casual like that, or my family would be better off without me. Now I want you to think about how you might react, what you might say. And I don't expect you to have, you know, a perfect answer. There's no right answer here. But if we're going to be peer listeners, we have to be prepared to potentially hear things that are like this and be ready potentially to respond to them. Maybe some of us have heard something like this from somebody that we care about before, in which case, you know, if you feel comfortable, again, remember this is all anonymous, um, share some of those things. And thanks for sharing. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me more about that? Have you thought about hurting yourself? Mm -hmm. Tell me about this weight you're carrying. What's going on with you? It could be something that's casual about what's going on with you. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine not having you in our lives. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can say, like, why would you say that? Why are, you, why are you thinking that? Let's talk about this. Mm -hmm. Remember, we want them to talk about it. Tell me more about what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, do you really think that's true? It's okay to challenge them a little bit. Remember, it's good to challenge them. Like, what makes you think that? Do you really think that's true? And asking specifically about what's making them feel that way so they can talk about it. Looks like we've kind of stayed at 22. I'll give just a moment longer if anybody else who wants to enter. And again, remember, you don't have to. And I know that this can be tough to talk about. Okay, that looks like everybody. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so the next few slides we're going to be talking about um, abuse to begin with, um, alcohol and substance abuse. So we know that about 13% of uh, adults in the U.S. have a problem with alcohol. In fact, one in eight can be considered alcoholics. Um, men have a tendency to develop uh, substance dependencies at a higher rate, particularly alcohol dependency at a higher rate. Than women, and there might be a number of different um, reasons for that that can be physiological, that they have a higher tolerance and therefore have pushed that extreme more in their life. Um, but it can be for other reasons too. It could be for social cues, for instance. We also know that the abuse of alcohol and other substances are not only factors in suicide, like we just talked about, but they're also associated with homicides and other crimes. Um, and it can also be associated with domestic violence and, and child abuse. We know some warning signs of alcohol abuse include um, overall increased use. If you know 
the the drinking habits of your of your buddy that you're talking to and you notice that now they're drinking a lot more or they say like they're drinking a lot more that's something to pay attention to maybe they're morning drinking being day drinkers or um, sneaky drinking they're figuring out ways to put it in a container so you can't quite tell what it is that they're drinking it might be that they are are visibly impaired either in social or in you know occupational and work environments that they're visibly drunk um, daily drinking that's not something that um, is healthy for humans. And so if you start noticing that, it might be that somebody is struggling with, you know, an alcohol disorder. Um, also, you know, tremors and sh shakes when they're not in use, which showing that they're actually having a physiological response to withdrawal. Different types of um, drinking follows different types of patterns. So there's chronic drinkers, those that drink large amounts all the time, every day. Um, and they drink until they're drunk. Those people, like they plan all of their activities around alcohol consumption, um, and that means when they're in social events, they're inebriated, and where they're in you know, work events, they might be inebriated too. There's also the social alcoholic, and those are the ones that say like, oh, I just drink socially, but maybe they do it to a little bit too much of an extreme, where they're drinking primarily like nights and weekends and around social events and things, they might not be craving anything, their work performance is usually affected, but they still might be drinking too much for their health. Um, and then there's binge drinking, and those are the periods, um, folks that uh, drink until drunk, but then it might be followed by periods of abstinence. But when they are on a binge, they're usually on a multi-day binge and are, are drunk for a long period of time. There are lots of different treatments out there for alcohol and substance abuse. I'm not listing them all here, but alcohol and Alcoholics Anonymous is something that a number of us have, have heard of before, if you're not familiar with, but there's also Narcotics Anonymous, there's Al-Anon, there's different support groups out there. Basically, the first bullet just basically talking about support group type programs where groups that are all suffered from uh, substance abuse or are the, you know, relations of folks that have, you know, suffered from substance abuse, get together and talk about these things and work through some kind of program. There's also medical detoxification, where people physically have to go in and under medical supervision, uh, go through the withdrawal period so that they um, don't end up worse. It can be incredibly hard physiologically on a body to go from withdrawal of alcohol or other substances. And so it is important that they go through medical um, supervision during that period of time. And sometimes that means inpatient, inpatient treatment. And that includes medical detoxification and um, support so it's kind of a combination of those, those first two bullets there where you're going through learning tools and things like that of, of how to not um, continue to abuse that substance and then there's outpatient treatment where folks might um, have adequate support outside of a, a facility but they are expected to um, abstain from whatever the thing is that they're abusing without regular supervision so we're going to do a quick poll knowledge check right here which of the following is not a warning sign of alcohol abuse? Tremors and shaking when not drinking, overall pattern of increased use, social or occupational impairment, or inconsistent explanations for injuries? We are looking for one correct answer here, but again, it's anonymous. Nobody's going to judge you. Great. Okay, we see like kind of answers in all of them right there, but what we were looking for is that inconsistent explanation for injuries. And while that could potentially be a little bit confusing, you know, if you're falling down because you're inebriated all the time, you might not want to explain how you got that bump on your head. But generally speaking, the other ones are all signs of alcohol abuse. Thanks. In the next few slides, we're gonna be talking about other types of abuse, and that's domestic violence. Um, again, this is some heavy material, so if you need a breather, please feel free to take one. No judgments here. So domestic violence can fall into several different categories. From physical violence, something that is um, very obvious where you're being um, physically harmed by an abuser, to emotional abuse, where maybe there's no literal bruises or scars, but there can be emotional ones. Um, sexual abuse, which is just like a clown, but it can also go so far as to be forcing uh, reproductive decisions on someone, and that's when it gets into like reproductive coercion, is what it's called. And that can be um, refusing to uh, use birth control, or forcing someone to use birth control, or um, forcing an abortion on someone, or refusing 
to allow them to get one, basically forcing someone to either have a child or not have a child, and that is violence. There's also financial abuse, um, and that can be restricting somebody from access to their own money, but it can also mean restricting the number of hours or locations that somebody can actually work, manipulating their ability to be independent by controlling their finances. But it can also be taking out credit cards in someone's name or stealing someone's social security um, number and maybe taking a second mortgage out on a house or something like that. And then there's digital abuse, and we're in a digital age right now, and then we're all in a extra forced to digital span at the moment. So digital abuse can, you know, kind of range all over the place, but it can be social media based. It can also be based on texts or emails. It might be um, threatening someone directly over those types of digital media, but it can be threatening to expose somebody or to share something. We know that on a typical day in the United States, unfortunately, um, domestic violence hotlines get about 20,000 calls. Um, in the U.S., there's about 20 people experiencing intimate partner physical violence every single minute. And that's a pretty staggering statistic. We also know that one in four women and one in nine men experience either severe intimate physical violence, sexual violence, and or stalking. We also know one in 10 women have been raped by an intimate partner. And it's likely that there are a number of men who have also experienced rape by an intimate partner. But unfortunately, there are no data available on that. The important thing to remember is that there's no community that's untouched by domestic violence. This isn't particular to any one type of community. Um, some symptoms of domestic violence can include unexplained burns and bruises, kind of like we were talking about in that poll earlier, but it can be withdrawal signs and depression. So this is where we're seeing some symptoms might overlap with one another. Low self-esteem, for instance. Um, we might see dependency on the abuser. Maybe somebody doesn't feel they can make a decision without the abuser's approval. Or maybe they literally um, feel like they cannot live their lives without their abuser because their self-esteem is so low. If it's children, you might see chronic discipline problems, perhaps. Um, problems in school when they're allowed you know, to go to school, go back to school. Or there might be an unwillingness to go home, which can be particularly hard now where we're under stay-at-home orders and people are forced to be at home. And so they're forced to be at home with their abusers. Um, and abuse can even span into you know, nightmares and exaggerated fears where they appear to be afraid of something other than the thing that um, is actually abusing them or the person that's actually abusing them. But these are the things that we want to keep an, an ear out for when we're being peer listeners. Now, unfortunately, um, domestic violence did not take a break during this current crisis. Um, for instance, the National Sexual Assault Hotline has seen a 22% increase in contact by minors calling in just in the month of March alone. 67% um, of those minors identified their abuser as a family member, and 79% of those minors that called said they were currently living with that abuser. Police have also noted in reported an increase in rates of domestic violence calls um, during these stay-at-home orders. So we do know that this is a problem. It's always been a problem. Um, it's particularly a problem right now. And this is something that if we're going to be engaging with our community members, that we want to be listening for. So brief poll knowledge check. Only women experience domestic violence. That's false. That's correct. Unfortunately, um, it's not just women, and it's not just um, females. You know, it says women there implying adult women, but it's not just, you know, uh, females. It's boys and girls, men and women, and um, everything in between. So this last section right here that I'm going to be leading you through is on something called ambiguous loss, and that's pretty much what it sounds like. It's this feeling of loss where we don't have a clear sense of closure or understanding about what's happened. Um, it can leave somebody feeling kind of at loose ends. They're not sure where to turn because they can't quite label it or put a finger on that thing that they've actually lost. It's not clearly defined for them. And this can really delay the grieving process. Um, some examples might be infertility or the, the loss of a pregnancy. It might be um, the disappearance of a family member or a pet or something where you don't know what happened to that person. It can be the death of, it says ex-spouse here, but it can be the death of somebody that used to be important to you. 
um, and is no longer an active part of your life, but you hear of their death and you still are feeling the sense of loss that you can't quite define. It could be somebody um, experiencing family members with dementia or Alzheimer's where they're no longer mentally present and so they're lost to them in some way. But it can be things like loss of dreams, like you always wanted to be something when you grew up or you always thought you would travel and see someplace, you know, in your adult life. And once that's no longer available to you, you have a sense of loss about that. And it can be canceled events too. And I think that's something we're all experiencing that we'll talk a little bit more about too. So there's two main types of ambiguous loss. The first one is a physical presence of that thing, but the psychological loss of whatever that thing is. And this is something, for an example, like I talked about um, a family member undergoing um, Alzheimer's or experiencing dementia, where that, that person that we love is physically present or that thing that we care about is there, but they are no longer psychologically available to us. And this can leave people feeling um, insecure and have a general sense of loss that um, in their life that they can't quite pin down. Um, but there's also the psychological presence where the, the thing or that person is, is there, um, but they're physically no longer around. So they feel like they're still with us. And that's something where um, maybe you don't know what happened um, to a lost family member. Um, maybe you feel like there's a chance something can come back again. And without knowing that, you're unable to move on and fully grieve. And this is something that is seen for instance, that can be passed down through generations. So we see this in, in uh, family members of the victims of the Holocaust, is that you have generational impacts and these feelings of uh, psychological um, presence, but physical loss of something. So as peer listeners, we're here to help people overcome this, these challenges, but um, ambiguous loss can be challenging for peer listeners and therapists alike because it is hard to label and pin down. So we're asking you, if you're going to do this, to be collaborative in um, the discussion of ambiguous loss with, with the person that you're listening to, like helping them to see um, that there's a light at the end of the tunnel that's reconstructing hope, um, finding out ways to have fun, encouraging them to look forward because that's how we continue to be resilient to these types of challenges, but also encouraging them and allowing them to accept things that are, are unavoidable. So some examples uh, of ambiguous loss in our current crisis, um, and I think all of us can think of a lot, we're gonna do that for an activity too, not being able to see somebody in a hospital. Um, canceled uh, surgeries. Um, I was telling somebody the other day, this, this bullet where it was on NPR and this woman was talking about that she had a radical double mastectomy um, to prevent the spread of, of breast cancer, but she was not allowed to have reconstructive surgery because it was considered elective. Well, it didn't feel elective to her. It felt very necessary for her to be made whole again, but that was something that she was feeling as a complete loss. But it might be like not able to attend a funeral or other major life events like a, a wedding. Maybe it has to be canceled or po postponed or moved. And I know a lot of our, our children and nieces and nephews and grandchildren have experienced like canceled proms or maybe graduations aren't being held the way that we remember them. And then general separation from our family can lead to feelings of ambiguous loss. So we're gonna go back out to Menti again and do one more activity. At this point, I'm going to pass the reins over to Tracy, and she's going to lead you through the rest of the training. So thank you all so much, and take it away, Tracy. Thank you, Missy. So you should be able to go back to your Minty screen. And there should be a question there that says, what examples of ambiguous loss have you heard about or experienced? And it looks like many of you have found that and you're already starting to put your answers in. Great. We'll give everyone a second to do that. not being able to spend Mother's Day with your mom and grandmother. I, I know that was very difficult for me yesterday as well. 
not being able to experience or be there for the birth of a, a new baby, whether it be a grandson or someone else that's very close to you. Not being able to um, have your regular routine of going to the office. Graduation ceremonies, I know there's been some really unique ways people have been trying to celebrate those in these times, for sure. I know my kids are sort of mourning the loss of saying goodbye to their teachers and their friends for the school year. And, and one of mine will not be going back to that particular school, so she's sad about that. Yes, proms, all of these events that we really depend upon being around family for, funerals. These are all very good examples of ambiguous loss. You know, I feel like this is one of the things that we're experiencing um, probably collectively as a whole across not only our nation but the world, this just sort of feeling that everything stopped and um, when are things going to open back up, when will we be able to do these things again and and even have some, some closure um, from some of these events. Give everybody a few more seconds to answer these. Yes, all the summer sports, many things have been canceled, summer camps. Yes, some other examples of people not being able to have those elective surgeries and they might be in pain and you can't be with them during this time. Yes, all of these. Thank you for sharing. Um, you know, in some ways, it, it, I think it also helps me to see that you are all going through a lot of similar things or have experienced a lot of similar ambiguous loss that I have during this time. Um, and that in itself is a way to connect us and have that commonality. There is a second question here um, that I wanted you to answer. So I'm going to move to that screen now and it should come up for you. Um, how does it make you feel to listen to stories of loss? So on a personal level, as a peer listener, you will be listening to many stories from those that you are trying to help. So I'd like for you to just take a second and let us know how that's going to make you feel. Okay. I'm seeing both um, positive and sort of what can be considered negative in terms of listening to the stories, and I think that's very true. In some, way, in some ways you feel more connected and you feel compassionate, you feel empathy, but on the other hand, you're exhausted, it's tiring, you feel sad um, for them. It might trigger things for you. You might have your own feelings of grief and helplessness. Yes, some people said that, and even that, that tiredness and that weight can feel heavy. Sure. We'll give folks just a few more minutes if you want to let us know how that would make you feel when you're hearing those stories. Clearly, many of you have already been doing some peer listening, maybe in an um, informal way. And so you know exactly how it's make, made you feel reflective. And I do think it, that, you know, connected is, is very large so far in this world, word cloud along with SAB, but I do think that that is a connecting point. Just as I was mentioning that it, it makes me feel, um, at least at some level, some connectedness to all of you knowing that you're experiencing similar feelings of ambiguous loss. If you have any last minute things you would like to put in here about your feelings, I just want to tell you the reason we want to ask this question is because 
if if you are going to be peer listening, I think it's extremely important. And what we're going to cover in this last module is, you know, that you, there are going to be some repercussions to that for you as a peer listener. You are going to be experiencing a variety of emotions, and it's important for you to know that that will happen. All right, thank you for those answers. I'm going to switch back over. This is our last module of, if you've been with us um, from the beginning, this is module four. So this is the final one. And we're really going to focus right now on seeking and providing support. And this is so important, not only for you to take care of yourself as a peer listener, but also for you to know when you may need additional support from others, such as like a mental health specialist or a therapist or a counselor, someone um, who specializes in helping um, once it gets to a certain point and you need to refer someone. So I guess the first message here is that um, you are really not meant to bear this burden um, to the extent um, that uh, that someone needs additional help. You know, when you start to feel uncomfortable, that's the time in which uh, you need to refer. So there's going to be times when, you know, that, that listening and being there for them, maybe even your, your acts of physical support, like caring for their, um, for, for their child so that they can have a minute, there are going to be times where that's not going to be enough. And so a referral is going to need to happen so that you can align your friend with a professional, someone who can um, help them and um, with maybe some just uh, additional practices, uh, maybe additional support groups, things that can help them move along. Um, now this could be, this kind of support could be legal, it could be financial, it could be emotional help, um, spiritual help. Again, it's going to be um, some kind of a, a mental health specialist or therapist or group that they can attend. And so the big part of referrals is don't hesitate to make a referral. And we're going to talk about some ways you can do that and even some of the language that you can use. It can be as simple as writing down a telephone number or researching a particular um, facility that's in your area that you know um, they can get some good response and resources from. Um, it can be that simple all the way up into, you know, offering to go with them. So there's, there's lots of levels of being able to refer, but please don't hesitate to um, let the person know that you don't know how to solve their problem. And if you really think about it, that's going to build your trust with that person as well. So just because you feel like you can't handle it beyond that point, they know you're being honest and they're going to appreciate that honesty and they're going to continue to come back to you for listening because just because you're referring them does not mean that they will not still need some peer listening from you in a supportive way. So make sure to guide your friend and considering all the different courses of action and the resources. So think about this as if, if someone was physically sick and, you know, you had a loved one that was physically sick, you would ask the doctor a lot of questions. And so it's the same thing when someone um, is experiencing some of these symptoms that Missy covered, you want to be sure that you go through and think about all the courses of actions and the resources that could be available to them, just like if it was um, a physical ailment. Um, and then again, just be willing to help the person find someone who's able to help them and just make sure that they know how much you care about them throughout this process, that you're not going to um, quit being their peer listener, but that the kind of help that they seek may need to, needs to be from a from a, um, a professional therapist or mental health specialist. So when to make a referral, this is going to be unique to each person. And so you're going to need to think about this and at least kind of have in your head a plan for what you might do. So when you're in over your head and you just Feel like um, what you're doing is, is maybe not helping, um, that the person seems to be going down um, a road that you're not comfortable with in terms of showing increased signs of symptoms, and you just feel like you need uh, someone else that can help you. So that's that you're going to know that feeling, and that's going to be unique to you as a peer listener. It can also become when you feel increasingly uncomfortable with how the conversation is going. And so I mean, in that regard, you could be increasingly uncomfortable with the content, 
but it also could be that what they're telling you is triggering something um, in, inside of you. And so I'll give you an example. Um, so I have three children, and so I'm very protective in general of, of children. I've been a Girl Scout leader, a Sunday school teacher, and so I'm very protective of children. So when people tell me um, or give me an example of how a child has been hurt or abused, it triggers something inside of me to immediately be defensive or you know, even angry. And I know that about myself. And if that were to happen in a peer listener situation, I would need to take a step back and find someone else that could be um, less strongly biased or that it would be less of a trigger for them so that they could talk the person through that. And you may have those triggers as well. And as a peer listener, you may not even realize that you have them until you um, start trying to help others. If you believe that there's not really much possibility of improvement um, throughout the course of the conversations you've had or if the, ho the situation seems hopeless, you would want to refer. Um, if the person that you visit with is saying that nothing is helping um, or what you provide them is not helping, then that probably means that they're ready for um, some additional expertise and resources that you can, that you can help guide them towards. Um, if there's an obvious change in their speech or their appearance. Now, I will tell you that this one is a little bit harder to discern during quarantine because um, as people are working more um, in their homes um, and then they may already have a little, look a little bit different in their physical appearance, right? They might not be dressing up as much as they normally do or fixing their hair or wearing makeup or so they might already be a little bit more ca casual in their at home situation. However, you are likely still going to be able to pick up on any major changes and those are the ones that we're talking about where they're clearly um, have not had hygiene or they're not looking at you when they're talking to you. You're going to be able to pick up on those physical changes. If the person gets to be so emotional where he or she can't communicate well, then that's a sign that you need to refer um, but in general, if there's just an ongoing deterioration of their life, both socially and physically, and that could mean if, there, if it's a depression that you're, uh, that you're dealing with, it could be that they've completely withdrawn. Maybe you've tried uh, a text message or you've tried to get in touch with them and they're not showing up and they're not um, answering um, your text messages like they normally would. Even something that simple, you know that there's some kind of a deterioration going on and that they may need additional support. Some additional things to think about when making a referral is um, if the person, all they discuss are physical complaints, then there could be something um, physiologically that's going on that's causing this that's beyond something that you're going to be able to help them with. And so you would need to refer um, them the best that you can for some of the local resources that you know about. If there's an onset of memory loss or confusion, again, there could be something that is, is that you, you cannot see on the outside and you need uh, to be able to refer them. If you see signs or you know of substance ab abuse, so maybe um, let's say that you're not in person and you are um, having a virtual meeting with this person, but you notice that they have alcohol out at all times of the day now. You know, they used to joke about it, but now you physically see them partaking every time you're talking to them. That's something that you could still see um, over a virtual meeting with them. Obviously, if they're telling you they are having hallucinations or delusions or some kind of severe pathology, um, threats to self-harm, as Missy talked about before, or harm to other people, that they're so angry that they think they're going to hurt someone else and that that's scaring them, then again, that would be a referral. Um, aggression and abuse, that could be both verbal and physical. And again, um, as a peer listener, you don't know that verbal abuse could come out on you. For instance, um, if you're listening to them and they know that they can trust you, especially when they know they can trust you, then that verbal abuse can be the hardest on those that they care about and trust. So you need to think about how you will um, internalize that or be able to handle that. And it may get to a point where you need to refer them. If the situation for you especially seems horrible or unbearable or for them, so they're in a situation that they feel like they can't um, get out of and they have talked about how it feels unbearable, that's the time to refer. That would be like a domestic uh, violence situation or child abuse. Most importantly, if you're unsure, it's better to refer someone. So 
since we're all going to have different comfort levels with that and, and knowing when to refer, let's just talk through how you would prepare for a referral, some of the things that you might say, um, what an example might be, so that then when the time comes, you've thought through all of these stages in this process. The first thing you're going to want to do is prepare some kind of, of confrontation, and it should be a very caring confrontation. We're only going to confront this person to express genuine concern. So you've seen a deterioration in the communication that you've had with this person, and uh, you, you feel like you have to bring it up because you just feel like what you're doing is maybe not being as supportive or not working anymore and they need some professional assistance. And so you, they need to know that you're coming from a, a place of caring. So I'm bringing this up because I care about you or I have been worried about this. Please be gentle. Remember to be gentle with the person. Think about how you would want to be approached because it's sometimes very difficult when someone confronts you about something that you know deep down is a problem, but you're bringing up a lot of sensitive issues. And so you just want to be gentle in the way that you speak with them and make sure that you're, you make your positive intentions known to them up front. Um, when, when you're doing this, you're in a private place, you want to make sure that there's no interruptions. Um, you don't want to do this in front of you know, their spouse or in front of their children if you can help it, if you can find a private space and just step away for a moment or um, try to catch them at a time um, where they can walk outside and, and have a private conversation with you. And then, uh, most importantly, you want to discuss very specific behaviors about why you're bringing this up. Um, so if you start off by saying, you and I are friends, um, we've been friends for a long time, but I've noticed in our, you know, past conversations, you seem to be getting more and more depressed, or you seem like um, you're relying on your uh, wine more and more, or whatever, however the conversation needs to go, um, especially if you notice um, uh, physical signs such as bruises um, that you want to ask them about. You just want them to understand that that you're not bringing this up um, just on a whim, that you have a list of specific behaviors that you have noticed when you've been listening uh, to them. And then I like to think about the, the process uh, with these four headings. You ask, you listen, you locate, and then you support. So let's look at the ask. Um, ask what they feel or what they think. And again, being confronted is going to be difficult and probably emotionally painful for them. Um, it might be hard initially for them to respond to your concerns, um, especially in an honest way. But you need to give them that time, and especially if they're able to respond, then you really want to listen to what they have to say. And as you're doing that, you need to check for understanding. Make sure that that you're showing them that you're trying to understand and, and you can even ask some questions um, to be sure that you're on the same page with them. And so that asking of questions, you know, leads right into the listening to the reasons for why they may not have sought help before. There could be barriers that you do not know exist. And so the last thing you want to do is place judgment or have them think you're placing judgment on them. So they might be afraid to be labeled as mentally ill. They might not be able to afford the consultation fee uh, to go and seek uh, some, some professional help. They're probably scared and not knowing what to expect. And there could just be some personal fears about what kinds of emotions they're going to experience when they do finally confront a problem. So then after they have been brave enough to share with you and you've listened, then you can help them by locating community resources. Um, generally, now there are some national hotlines um, and, and some of those um, are in the references that you'll be getting at the end of this presentation, but you also have a lot of local resources. And so if you can be prepared with that and sort of know where to go, um, you can offer to even call the counselor um, and go to the first appointment as moral support. You wouldn't obviously go into the room with them, but you could at least take them to the first appointment if that's something that you feel comfortable doing. Um, or you could just leave them the name and number of a good counselor with your friend and then check to see if they followed up. And then finally, just know that being supportive 
and continuing to be supportive is so important. So, you know, if you get rejected, just continue to offer that support. Um, continue to offer to be a listener. Don't get discouraged. Um, but it may take that person some time. So an example here might be, Jill, over the past few weeks, you've told me it's been difficult for you to be quarantined with your family. I know you mentioned that your husband has had a short temper and that all of you are under a lot of stress because you're not sure when you get to go back to work. But lately, I've known that you seem more and more depressed. And the last time we talked, you know, I overheard some very strong language in the background. Um, are you okay? And that can be, you know, just a brief example of how you're trying to ask, how are they feeling? How are they, what are they thinking about? And then it opens it up for them to then share with you so that then you'll know if it's time for a referral. If that doesn't work um, and the person seems like they're not very receptive, but you're really concerned about them, such as in the example that Missy gave earlier, you're afraid they might harm themselves. You can do what we call an independent intervention, which is what we're showing now on the screen. So you could contact the agency and speak to an intake worker yourself. That could be a mental health agency. It could be an alcohol or substance abuse agency, you know, something that's very specific to the symptom that they're um, displaying. Now, if you do that, you're going to need to identify yourself and describe your relationship with the person that you've been listening to and state your view of the problem as a listener, what you feel like you, you know, you've heard and the, the signs and the warning signs that you've seen and note how long it has existed. That's very helpful for anyone who's um, taking in that information from an agency. And then, you know, you would ask them what kind of follow-up they might be able to do. If it's reaching out to the individual um, or if it is um, somehow uh, providing some uh, potentially free resources, if that's, a, if that's available. Some of our local agencies do have that for like your first consultation. And so we ask them what they're going to do um, to follow up. So if you need to do an independent intervention, you can do that. I, as a peer listener, have not personally had to do an independent intervention. Um, most of the time, I think that that you're going to have the type of relationship that that person is going to um, trust you and hopefully seek some additional support. But it is there, especially if you know that they might need it. So let's do a quick knowledge check. And again, this will be another multiple choice question. And so if you need to refer your friend to a mental health specialist or a therapist, okay, if you need to refer them, um, and here, what are the times that you might have to do that? So you just want to check all that apply. There could be more than one. So just any of these that you think are correct. If you think they may harm themselves or others, should you refer? Are you able to actively listen and they can express their feelings of relief? Then do you need to refer? You feel continually uncomfortable with a conversation, should you refer? Um, they tell you their spouse is driving them crazy, should you refer? So just take a few seconds and the poll should come up on your screen. Okay, so it looks like most of you answered the first bullet. You think they may harm themselves? Absolutely, that's 100% a correct answer. And then the third bullet, you feel uncomfortable with the conversation? Absolutely, you should definitely refer then. Um, and, you know, a few people put the last uh, bullet, and I can see where um, if that is gotten to a point where it's really escalated and it seems like there's increased anger or potentially domestic violence, that could be a situation. Um, or it could be on the spectrum of, oh, they're, you know, they couldn't find the spoons again, you know, or they couldn't, you know, they didn't know where the remote control was. Those are, those of course, are probably ones that you would not need to refer for. Great. Thank you for that. So now we're moving into um, the final part of, of the last module, and this is really, to me, one of the most important things that we talk about, and this is how you can 
take care of yourself as a peer listener. So we like to use this analogy of you put the oxygen mask on you first, and then the important thing is for you to remember to keep it on because you're going to be um, potentially handling a lot of very complex situations, and so it's important for you to take really good care of yourself. So here's some coping skills for peer listeners. I think all of these are great. You've probably seen these before, just in uh, regular how to take care of your own mental health presentations. But I think it's worth mentioning that we need to all be taking time for physical exercise, even if it's just 30 minutes a day, even if it's taking a conference call while you're walking around the neighborhood, whatever that means, you're taking some time out of the day to get up, to be active, and to, to get your, your heart rate up and, and get yourself um, outside potentially. So being outside, we all know is good for us, eating healthy food um, when we can find it at the grocery stores, right? Um, stay connected with our friends and our family and our colleagues. So especially if you're living alone and you can't visit with many of your family right now, it's really important that you try to talk to them on the phone or try to see them virtually when you can. Get adequate sleep, you know, plan for seven to eight hours. This seems, some, these all seem pretty straightforward, but let me give you a quick example. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier I have children, and so one of the things I've noticed during the quarantine is that uh, my two sons are not sleeping as well as they normally have. So what does that mean? That means my five-year-old is sometimes coming in in the middle of the night to get in our bed. And so that means that I have to watch my sleep because he is having trouble with his sleep. And so maybe that means I have to go to bed a little bit earlier because I know I'm going to get that interruption. You know, we're trying to kind of get down to the root of what me might be causing that. But it could be someone else in your family that is making some of these coping skills hard, right? So just kind of have to keep a check on that. Seek opportunities for relaxation. If you can use breathing exercises, I've noticed a lot of people doing yoga, stretching, meditation. Um, my oldest uh, daughter has uh, started taking baths. She never did that before quarantine, but it's a way for her to relax. So um, it can be as simple as that. If you can plan and take a vacation, that's great. Sometimes just the planning part can be exciting and it can get us thinking about, you know, a time when um, we're not uh, so restricted in our movement. And sometimes planning a vacation or even just a walk outside of the home to a, a nearby park or maybe a, a national forest or a state park um, can seem like a vacation. Even camping in the backyard might seem like a vacation for us right now. If we can continue old hobbies that we have or discover new hobbies, this is a good time to do that again because it takes our mind off of some of the stressful things that we might be experiencing. So overall, um, one of the things that we can do is try to control the things that we have control about. So I like this diagram because it helps us to know what we can really focus on as peer listeners. So we can focus on our own attitude and, and trying to be positive. We can turn off the news or any other distractions that we seem to always feed into that we know cause us additional stress or maybe make us anxious. We can uh, follow the recommendations that are coming out to the best of our abilities. Um, we, can, we can control how we choose to social distance, you know, with others, so our, within our own um, households or families, and um, the things that we choose to do uh, at home. And then there's all these other things around the outside of the circle that we really don't have control over. We can't control what other people are doing. Um, we can't really predict when things are going to be 100% better or as people keep talking about normal or, you know, that kind of thing. So I like the way that this brings it in and says, look, your focus should just be these things that are in this tight circle because these are the things you control. And if you try to focus on the other things, it's going to cause you a lot of um, undue stress and anxiety. So here's a few. I'm sorry, yeah. you had a question I wanted to make sure that you were aware of. Um, okay. If you were a peer listening with someone that is a coworker, especially now that we're all teleworking, are there any sort of um, requirements in terms of notifying HR if you have concerns? Okay, so that's a, that's a really great question. Um, you know, I've not had to do that while in quarantine, 
but if if you have um, if you're a supervisor um, and you have that responsibility to report then the person that you're listening to needs to know that otherwise they're going to assume that everything that you're talking about is confidential just between coworkers. So some of that um, GD to report depends upon your, um, your role as, uh, as a supervisor or if you have that um, duty to report and that's different I think for every organization and that needs to be made known to the person before they divulge too much information to you. If you do not have a, that duty to report and it's a coworker, then my suggestion would be that if it seems like the person needs additional support and help, that you go ahead and try to make some sort of a referral and that you encourage them um, to contact HR on their own, which they should be able to do. And if, if that's not working and they don't feel comfortable with that, then I would ask, I, I think it would be also appropriate to refer them to a local um, agency, depending upon what the issue is, because sometimes they might feel more comfortable doing that than they do within their own home organization. I hope that helps a little bit. So um, the next slide here is self-care tips for work. And I know that we've all seen these before. I think that some of these are easier said than done. So establishing a routine, um, it depends on if it's for yourself or it's for yourself and your entire family if you're in quarantine together. But um, setting start and stop times for work is extremely important. And I will be honest, this is something I've had the hardest time with while in quarantine because trying to have a Zoom schedule for my children's schoolwork, um, my two oldest ones have set Zooms, my youngest has one like once a week, so it's not as often, um, and, and trying to then help them with those things, then oftentimes I don't put a stop time on my work because I just consider it as catch up, you know, oh, I've got, I've had to, I have to catch up because I um, was helping them earlier today, and that's really not, um, the best way to do it. You really need to have some start and stop time so that then you're not always feeling like you are playing catch up. You need to have some very defined tasks every day, try to, to get those tasks in and then move the others to the priority list for the next day. Again, when you're freshest in the morning and all of us have, have come across this before, taking the important tasks first and then selecting a realistic number to complete, as we just mentioned. Managing your email inbox. I don't know about you, but um, it seems like my emails have really increased over the time that we've been in quarantine and I don't always do the best job of managing this. I try now sometimes to turn off of off my email during certain times of the day and then come back to it and, and have a goal of, you know, getting through a certain number of emails. Setting deadlines for yourself is very important even when we're in quarantine. Taking breaks. Um, I sometimes have to step away from the computer screen for a while. I, it, it really hurts my eyes to be at staring at the screen and Zoom meetings and trainings like what we're doing now really take a toll. And so, you know, after that, I have to take some time to step outside um, and I can take my work with me, but maybe it's um, a document that I can edit and I can sit outside and do that for a few minutes so I'm not looking at a screen. And then intentionally plan time away from work. You know, one of the things that I find kind of ironic is that you know, it, it, when you're at work, planning a time to be away from work seems a little bit easier. Now that we're in quarantine, I know for myself personally, when I look around my house, I see things and work that could be done all the time, right? So it's not office work, but it's homework. And that, that work from home is still work. And your body needs an opportunity to get away from both your office work and your homework, such as dishes and laundry and, you know, papers that need to be sorted or whatever that might be. And so I think for me, it took a while to really realize at least, you know, several weeks into this that I was just working all the time and that by being at home, it was increasing the amount of time I was working, um, regardless of whether or not it was for the office or for like my family, just keeping the household up. So just remember that self-care is not selfish and it's extremely important that we do this for ourselves so that we can um, be effective. So we're gonna go um, for the last time back out to the Mentimeter. And the question we're gonna ask this time is if you could please list an example of a coping skill that is important 
to a peer listener's self-care. So think about this, and I'm going to switch over to Mentimeter, and if you'll give me a second to go to the next slide. An example of a coping skill that is important to a peer listener's self-care. Great. Yes, all of these. Exercising, being outside, knowing your personal limits, sleeping, you know, having clear boundaries, keeping a schedule. Knowing how to express your own stress so that then you can help others. Yes, that's a definitely a one. Taking breaks from work. Yes. Playing, I like that, that's true, yes. We'll give everyone a few more seconds to get their answers in. You know, this one where you wrote, take a break when you need one, I think that that is, um, it's really good. I'll be honest, sometimes I don't always recognize when I need one and I found that um, sometimes I have to set a timer so that I can remember how long I've been on the screen or doing something so that then I'll get up and move around. I get distracted, I guess, get into my work. I see a few people are still entering things, so we'll give everyone a second. Yes, there is no perfect. Oh, wow. Singing opera, that, that's a great, just music in general. That's a great one. Excellent. It looks like you all are much better at, at um, your coping skills than I have been. I can take some tips from some of the things that you're putting up here. Finding something to look forward to, yes. You know, this one about staying hydrated, that's another one I can relate to. I usually have a water bottle with me at work and I just drink and drink and drink. And I've noticed since we've been in quarantine, I don't do that nearly as much. Great. Well, thank you for these responses. We're going to um, move back to the presentation real quickly. Um, and we're going to wrap up here um, with just a few quick review things. Just in summary, um, especially if you missed the, the first part, but also to just kind of bring it all home together here. Being a peer listener is really about being present, being there for other people, listening and watching to them, you know, watching them, um, being attentive to the message that they're trying to convey to you, trying to normalize how they're feeling, putting a name on it as Missy um, talked about before. And then really taking care of yourself. And this last one, the blooming in your own garden of relatives, friends, and neighbors, that's really re referring to trying to flourish in your own relationships. Because if you're having in a lot of struggles with your own relationships, then it's hard sometimes to help others. So you want to make sure that you keep check on that. Peer listeners are genuine. They're real in their relationships. They don't put up a facade. Um, they don't sometimes are there for you, sometimes not. You know, they're they're always there when you need them and they're empathetic. They understand and they share the feelings of the person that they're trying to help. They're also caring in a very non-possessive way um, with no expectations to really receive anything back from the person that they're helping. They're not uh, imposing their own judgments on someone and they're willing to let the person that they're ha helping ha take responsibility for their own growth and, and change. Um, and then finally, from this last part, we, we learned that peer listeners are aware of their own limitations, both their strengths and weaknesses, and they're willing to learn new skills so that they can listen better, which is what we did in part one. Um, and then they're committed to not only their own personal growth so that they can help others, but also um, just to the well-being of the other 
the other person and families that they're trying to help. And most importantly, you understand the big picture of connecting conversations so that then you can have a stronger community. You're simply being a friend. You're, you're telling people that you care about them and that you're going to help them and be there for them. And so I would just like to, to tell you how much we appreciate you taking time with us today, but also for your willingness to step into this important role to serve others. It can be a very rewarding experience, but it also um, can take its toll on you, which is why we talk so much about self-care. So one question that we did have for you um, is we wanted to know if there were any, if, if any of you would be interested in an online facilitated practice session where we review potential scenarios and how to respond to them. And so Tara has put that poll up and if you would just take a few seconds, um, it's okay, whatever your answer is, it will be anonymous, but we're trying to gain an idea of, of how many people would like to kind of do some role playing and whether or not that would be um, a good use of people's time to maybe go through a, a short practice session. And, and if we decide to do that, then we will for sure let everyone know um, when that would be and would send it out to you. So let me just tell you, um, at the end of this presentation, we do have, we, we are making this um, available to you online. And if you'll see here, I'm just scrolling through, we have some references that you'll be able to access. And so when we finish um, today, I'll be sending you a follow-up email. It'll have a recording of today's um, training of part two. It'll have a PDF of the PowerPoint that we used in case you want to refer back to it or share it with someone. It will have a link to the peer listener training manual. And then as I mentioned before, if we are, uh, do have a practice session, then we will make sure that we make that available to all of you. And so I know we went a few minutes over our hour and a half, but I did um, want to let you know that as we wrap up, if you have any uh, quick questions, we'll be happy to answer those. But Missy and I are also available via email um, at any point in time if, um, if you have any questions for us there as well. So I'll give you just a second in the chat box if there's some other questions that we may have missed while we were presenting. And Missy's going to come back on and I'll stop sharing my screen so that uh, you can see her as well. So I see that um, that Mark made the comment under coping skills that it's hard to plan and take vacations during the COVID-19 crisis. And I completely agree with that. Um, we sort of, in my family, we um, have done backyard camping and we've considered that to be like a vacation for my kids. So I guess it's really vacations in a more non-traditional sense, but you're exactly right. It is hard to do that. Um, they're less excited about those virtual things that you can do <laughs> online, but the outdoor uh, camping seems to be a good one. And then someone else made some comments that are, are really important here about um, uh, co-workers and um, especially for, um, let's see, for uh, possible harassment and, and that not just supervisors, but other university employees have the mandate to report. So yeah, it would be extremely important for you to know what your university's policy is. I'm sure it changes with the different universities. I also see Katie um, asked here about uh, who to contact regarding whether or not you want to put this training on for another audience. Well, we're training you so that you can train others. That's why we make these materials uh, available to you. You're welcome to either just show the recordings that we've already done, um, make the slides available, um, make the manual available or develop your own slides and training. So if you want, you can contact us if you want to um, adapt the slides, but you're also welcome to just download these materials and host your own trainings and spread, spread the peer listening around. It looks like the questions have, um, and have uh, wound down and I'm sure other You've got other things you've got to get to today, speaking of being on the screens, right? So thank you again for joining us. We really appreciate it. If there's anything we can help you with, we'd be happy to do that. Um, please feel free to, to reach out to us, and we'll be sending you some follow-up materials very soon. So have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone.